Strong history, religious buildings have been educational devices to one, communicate spiritual information and two, facilitate the experience of a spiritual reality. This double architectural purpose plays a central role in a society's spiritual learning, continuity, and growth. Not surprisingly, beauty has always been a protagonist as builders of holy structures almost universally figured that aesthetic delight is a great mean to facilitate such purposes. Without exaggeration, there are maybe no faster or easier way to access a spiritual state or reality than entering a sacred space. The fields of theological aesthetics and other scholarship have provided reasons for such practices and successes. Yet, lacking significant empirical evidence, these arguments cannot survive serious scientific scrutiny nor advance our comprehension of how architecture enables access to a spiritual reality. <clears throat> this presentation shares in-progress research work <clears throat> utilizing neuroscience to examine architecture's aesthetic capacity to produce spiritual cognitive outcomes. The revel of neuroscience has opened new windows to begin understanding how buildings affect people, which brings me to the word neurophenomenology in the title of this talk, a term that defines my research effort. And here I want to acknowledge the great Chilean neuroscientist Francisco Varela, who coined the word neurophenomenology, meaning the scientific approach that correlates human experience and neurophysiology, or what are usually called the subjective and objective perspectives of reality. With this vision in mind, I responded to a call for research proposal made by the Templeton Religion Trust. This video shows the intentions behind this program and frames very well the work my team and I are doing right now. What is art? That's a good question. Here's a more interesting question. What is the value of art in the human experience? Various theories have been advanced over the years. Pleasure. Beauty. Expression or stimulation of emotion. But as the philosopher Gordon Graham has argued, none of them can on its own explain the special value of great art. So what does Graham propose? That art is valuable as a source of knowledge and understanding. Aesthetic cognitivists like Christoph Baumberger have argued that artworks can provide us with new categories and new perspectives. Art, he says, can raise important questions, provide us with knowledge of what it would be like to have certain experiences or emotions or to be in a certain situation. Art can contrive thought experiments and deepen our understanding by enabling us to grasp connections between things we already know or believe. Art, according to aesthetic cognitivists, can improve our cognitive abilities. From this perspective, we don't look independently at reality and measure art's depiction of it by comparison. Instead, we experience the world in new ways through art. But is there an empirically demonstrable connection between art and understanding with reference to what Sir John Templeton referred to as spiritual reality in particular? Can art unlock new spiritual information? We're putting aesthetic cognitivism to the test. We're inviting painters, sculptors, musicians, artists of all kinds, along with art historians and musicologists, philosophers and theologians, and scientists from the psychological, cognitive, and social sciences to conceive and design empirical and statistical studies of the cognitive significance of the arts as it relates to spiritual realities and the discovery of new spiritual information. Art seeking understanding. With this, um, I'd like to now uh, share another short four and a half minute video that explains very well my research work. A 
across time, 9000 BC to this day, across civilization from Asia to the Americas, the best architecture over and over and over again is architecture devoted to some, something spiritual. Call it religion, call it you know community, call it whatever you want to call it, but it's something bigger than the self, bigger than a person, bigger than even a particular a culture. It's often said that sacred architectural spaces elicit profound feelings of awe, enlightenment, well-being, a connection to the spiritual, Professor Julio Bermudez is deploying modern technology and comparing both sacred and secular spaces to measure and test the cognitive, physiological, and psychological impacts of built spaces. Once you are trying to uh, understand how architecture works empirically, you can measure things. You first are trying to find a sort of theoretical framework that makes sense. Um, and one of the powerful theoretical frameworks is what is called aesthetic cognitivism. Aesthetic cognitivism um, asserts that experience of art is cognitive, is uh, epistemologically productive, meaning it delivers knowledge or understanding, and is empirically testable. To test this claim, Professor Bermudez recruited a group of 30 Roman Catholics to visit two Washington, D.C. buildings on consecutive days. Union Station and the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Both are beautiful spaces with ornate vaulted ceilings, liberal use of marble and statuary. Both are designed to accommodate masses of people, but one is intentionally sacred and the other is not. How do you measure uh, human responses to architecture with today's technology? That's the question. We start about a hundred yards away from the buildings. The subjects are told you're visiting the building you're not going to go to mass or you're not going to go to take a train but you go to visit the building the empirical side of it which is kind of all the the medical or, or physiological part has two components one is uh the brain which is kind of the most important one is going to be gauged through ambulatory eeg electroencephalogram that measures 20 points of the brain on the electroactivity of, of the brain the other aspect of it is measuring the corporal physiology. And this is done with a wristband that measures heart rate, blood pressure, heart rate variability, the electric conductivity of, of the skin, and a couple other things, the speed of movement and so on. So this wristband allows us to correlate the brain with the whole body, no matter how emotional or how spiritual, uh, how sensual it is, is fundamentally cognitive. It had to go through, you know, basically your brain at some level. Alongside these physiological measurements, the team will compare the subject's psychological responses to a set of questions asked during the experience. Professor Bermuda's research team is multidisciplinary, including an architect, a neurologist, a cognitive scientist, a theologian, and an electrical engineer. This idea of looking at circuit space and understand how is it possible that something like material, organized matter could produce a connection with something transcendental. It's important for very simple reason is that when you feel like that, you begin to act in the world very differently. You see the other in a different way. You see, you know, what constitutes development in different ways. Right now, we're about 8 billion people on this planet. And uh, within about 34 years, we're gonna hit about 12 billion. Think about that. We're gonna build more now than we have ever built. We know the built environment profoundly affect our well-being and not just personally, but also as a society operates. That for millennia, this was just discussed, but never been able to measure or to test. The fact that this is happening is just by itself incredible. That whatever we learn, is something we've been to know for the first time in human history. Thank you.